Hi, my name is Wojciech Bulate and this is my story with service virtualization. If you have ever heard about service virtualization and you would be interested in somebody else's story over a period of five years, please continue watching and you'll find some interesting things here for yourself. So I've been doing software development and testing for more than 10 years now, six of which was continuous delivery, continuous integration, TDD, BDD, pair programming and similar agile practices. And this is going to be a story about four companies. And I would like you to remember that I'm going to be presenting this story from the continuous delivery point of view. So whenever we're talking about something here, this is from the continuous delivery approach mindset. So the story begins in 2011, 2013, when I was working for organizations that were following the agile principles. And the first example is a media company, which did a hundred plus different applications uh, running or different code bases running on more than 200 JVMs working. There was 50 people working on those developers, QAs, database guys, ops guys, support, and they were very functional teams working closely together. So development would be ver working very closely to QA, uh, would be uh, working very closely to DBAs. There were separate teams, but they were working very closely together. And when it comes to service virtualization, and back then we used to call it stubbing, uh, we would do in-house build stubs. And that was because there was no lightweight products available at the time that would fit the continuous integration TDD uh, model for us that we could use uh, the open source alternative or anything like that. And those tools were used by developers and QAs, both for functional and performance testing. And what I've noticed was it took two to 10 days of development to develop such a tool. Then uh, the story continues and I go to an investment bank developing a risk system. This was a fairly large system running on a thousand servers in production managed by around 30 people, very cross-functional teams with uh, mixed with functional teams. So the developers would be doing a quality assurance and production support, but they had to um, talk to guys uh, that would provide the VMs, for example, where they would um, deploy uh, their production applications. And in that organization, we also build those tabs in house for developers. And it took only two days of development on average because they were very specialized. There wasn't much to be built. And at that time, there was still no lightweight products available that would suit our needs. So we had to build something in house and we didn't have to cater for QA's uh, requirements just because there were no QA's developers did everything. The story continues to 2013, 2015, where uh, I was introducing Agile to a retail bank. So the bank had some issues around their delivery. The releases were taking too long, six to 12 months. There was a lot of bugs in late stages of development, for example, UAT testing and production. And uh, it was quite expensive. So the complexity of the system was more or less the same as the risk application I was working and in the investment bank I have mentioned, but um, it was 20 times more expensive uh, than that system. There were also some architectural challenges. The web app was a monolith code base with a lot of low quality Java code. There were some, uh, it was connecting to middleware uh, gateways and C++ middleware, and then to 10, 20 plus backend systems via different protocols, HTTP, JMS, and custom TCP protocols. There was very little test automation, very long running builds, and the reverse testing pyramid in practice. So very little unit tests, some functional automated testing, some acceptance tests, and then a lot of manual testing uh, on the top. And there were very functional teams, but not working very closely together. So development and QA were kind of enemies. Uh, they wouldn't work uh, very closely together to start with. And there was a lot of junior guys, mostly the development and testing was done by junior guys offshore. And that was the first time I have heard about service virtualization. So in the past, I called this over the wire stubbing or over the wire mocking. And this was the first time I have heard the service virtualization term. 
So the bank wanted to increase the release schedule predictability and reduce the number of production defects. And they hired 15 very experienced and very high profile tech leads to make that change. And those tech leads worked on a few uh, large projects, strategic projects, like for example, modulizing the code base and moving to a different source control system, etc., etc. But they were also working on introducing some tactical uh, solutions to pick up the low hanging fruit and do something um, because the long strategic solutions would take a long time to implement. So one of those things they came up with was let's record the 20 plus backend system, automate testing uh, that way and see what happens. And that's how I got hired. So I was introduced to Say Lisa, C Service Virtualization is the current name for the system. And my first impression was that it was the first time I have seen this record and replay functionality, which was pretty cool. It was doing templating magic strings, that was cool as well. And uh, it was supporting many protocols. So uh, for us, the big win here was custom TCP protocols that the bank needed to do. And we proceeded to implementation and after six months, of trying to do continuous delivery, continuous integration, TDD, and those kinds of things with C Elisa. We found that C Elisa works and we've had some successes with it. And basically we made several teams happier than they were. They could use a tool to um, do stubbing or service virtualization. And we had around 300,000 pounds of, uh, of estimated cost savings but we've had some landings along the way. So what we found was that C Elisa didn't play very well with source control. So uh, the artifacts, the XML files it produces as its artifacts, you can source control them in Git, for example, but they're not very easy to merge or compare uh, different versions of those files. If you uh, keep in mind uh, uh, my background here and what I have seen in the past, I've seen it done uh, much nicer and much easier. Also, the centralized deployment infrastructure didn't play very well with our Jenkins build. So ideally what you want to have is everything should be contained within the build agent and it should do whatever it needs to do to build and test the application. But that didn't play very well with the centralized deployment infrastructure CA Lisa provides. And because of the licensing model and how heavy the infrastructure is, we couldn't implemented on every build agent, Jenkins build agent. Also, what we've noticed is that it was very hard to set up the stubs or virtual services from the test. So uh, what you usually want to do is have tests that have these three sections, the given section, the when section and the then section. And in the given section, what you're going to do is set up the prerequisites for the test. Then in you execute the test and then in the last section, you're going to be testing, uh, making some assertions. And in the given section, the first section of the test, what you want to do is set up your stubs to um, for the test um, to pass. And unfortunately, CA Lisa wasn't helping us with that. And it was possible, but it didn't look as simple as what we have seen in the past. And the bin shell extensions were causing us problems as well where, when scaling to other teams. So it wasn't very easy to write those things. You couldn't use tools like IntelliJ or Eclipse to write those extensions. And basically what we have seen in the past, if you wanted to write an extension to a stub was you would just implement a simple Java interface and use code completion and things like that in IntelliJ or, or Eclipse, whichever tool you want to use or NetBeans. But it wasn't possible here. You would have to do it in Lisa workstation. And it was quite counterintuitive for us. And you had to learn a, a lot of new things before you uh, could do something meaningful. So we had some learnings around the infrastructure as well. So our offshore VMs that were provided to our partners had very little resources and Lisa workstation that was taking a gigabyte of RAM and a lot of disk space didn't help us there, unfortunately. So um, those v VMs basically had not enough RAM memory to run, run the Lisa workstation. And what we're thinking, well, in the past we used um, simple web applications and you could just use the web browser to connect to that application. So we thought, yeah, that might have been a bit better for us probably at that time. And the infrastructure around separate VSC, separate registry and separate workstation 
caused us a few problems as well. So for example, you, uh, the recommended way was to record only in the workstation and what we would like to do quite often is record actually on the VSEs and uh, managing the workstations across many uh, VMs and many laptops was a problem just because of the versioning for example and how long it took to get them there and install etc. Um, we had some learnings around the licensing so we wanted to scale to more than 70 teams and ideally uh, have the keeping in the continuous delivery continuous integration TDD those kinds of things in mind we wanted to have a instance of Lisa per developer QA per team but that didn't look very feasible because of how it uh, the, the resources it consumed on the on on the system on your uh, VM or your laptop so uh, we thought okay let's have ch at least one per team but that still was a problem because of the licensing model so uh, we just couldn't do it and there was some general user experience learnings we uh, we had so we, we get the, got the feeling there was too many screens, too many controls and too many components in most of these um, tools that we just didn't need. It was a very, a very powerful tool, but we didn't need most of that functionality. So our main takeaway was that Lisa works. It's a great tool. It supports custom TCP protocol vir virtualization, JMS and HTTP. Uh, but um, when we tried to apply it to a continuous integration environment, it didn't work for us that well, as well as we would hope, keeping in mind our uh, experiences and my personal experiences as well uh, with stopping in agile environments. And it's worth mentioning here that other departments on the bank were using Lisa as well. Those departments were usually in the maintenance mode, uh, so there was no focus on fa faster release times, no focus on things like continuous delivery. And as far as I know, C Lisa was very successful in those environments. So it's also worth mentioning that in this retail bank, there was two in-house build tools that have been developed to do service virtualization or stubbing, however you want to call it. And they were done uh, to uh, there to uh, facilitate stubbing of specific components. And unfortunately, neither of those tools was able to record 20 plus backend systems. Uh, but what we found was when testing those individual components that they were designed to be uh, used with, uh, they fit very well into this continuous integration mindset. And it took around two to 10 days on average to develop such a tool. So the story continues to 2015, 2016, when I was back to a, on an organization that does a lot of Agile. So 130 plus different applications, different code bases running on a lot of JVMs in production, 50 people managing that and functional teams were working very closely together. And by this time, the Wiremark platform, an open source stabbing and service virtualization solution was mature enough that we could start looking at using it and what we've done was build a service virtualization solution or stabbing solution however you want to call it on top of wiremock and we've it was designed to use by both devs and qa so devs would use the wiremock uh, remote priming or remote setup programmatic apis and qas would use a gui a web gui that we've built on top of wiremock to do their exploratory testing and to do their performance testing. So the QAs were not very technical savvy uh, in this team and they needed a simple GUI to uh, navigate around the tool. And what I found was that it took around 15 days of pair programming over the last nine months to do it. So what we found was that Wiremog fits very well into this continuous integration mindset and it's a great tool for developers. It's got some bugs, it's still a new tool, but I would use it again if I had to, if I got a chance. And unfortunately we had to do some internal development on top of it just because it wasn't designed with QA, non-tech uh, savvy QAs in mind, so we developed a GUI on top of it. So what would be a logical next step for you if you were in my place? Well, for me, it was combining those experiences, the traditional and agile methodologies, 
and the experiences with those, the cross-functional functional and mixed team, seeing all of that. And having seen CA Lisa, for me close, CA Lisa right now called CA Service Virtualization and using that in this environment and using wire mock as well and building on top of that and coming up with a list of requirements. So having been in those four environments, four companies, uh, I came up with a list of requirements for a tool that would satisfy my needs in all of those circumstances. So what I wanted to have is a tool that would allow me to deploy anywhere, anytime and the licensing wouldn't get in the way. What I wanted to have is a lightweight tool that would consume tens of hundreds of megabytes instead of gigabytes of memory. And therefore, since the, license is, since the licensing is flexible and the tool is very lightweight, I could run it on an existing hardware. But that doesn't mean I couldn't run it in a centralized uh, manner if I wanted to. Um, I could run it both locally and centralized, but the tool shouldn't get in the way. Uh, either of those. I would like to be able to do both of those using the tool. So I would also be like to be able to run this tool locally or in a centralized environment and I wouldn't like the tool to get in the way. It doesn't matter if I want to run it centralized on some servers or locally on a laptop, the tool should support both. I would like the tool to be easy to integrate with CI tools like Jenkins and TeamCity, run it separately on build agents in an isolated environment to do CI properly. And I would like the tool to be designed with automation in mind, so easy to integrate with things like JBHF, Cucumber, JUnit, etc. Also, I would like to keep in mind not only devs but QAs in mind. So developers, they want CI, they want JUnit, they want TDD. What QAs want is the less tech savvy QAs, what they want is a nice GUI on top of the same stuff that the developers are using and uh, the same artifacts that uh, that stuff produces, but they want to be able to um, use a simple GUI and click through stuff and do their exploratory testing that way or their performance testing that way. I would like to have a tool that supports both functional and cross-functional teams and I would like a tool that ideally is very simple to use and doesn't need any training. So basically great user experience. And this is how I came to develop Traffic Parrot. And if you look at the, the tools on the market, there's definitely the option of going open source. And if I was to go open source, I'd probably go for Wiremock today. But if you wanna look at other tools and uh, things that are not necessarily Java related. Uh, you wanna do some Node.js or you know Ruby or something like that. Uh, the, I've compiled a list of 30 plus tools and you can go to blocktrafficpower.com and it's gonna be there. Um, so we can have a look at that. There's also an option of in-house development and it depends on the environment you're in, uh, you know, how, how experienced your developers are. Uh, is it junior, mid or only senior guys? and uh, that would inform how you would do it. But in my opinion, what I have seen, uh, it is when you've got mid-level to senior guys on your team, it's gonna take around five to 15 days to develop a QA GUI on top of Wiremog, uh, if you need to do that. And if you wanna start doing development and QA with different protocols than HTTP, like JMS or custom TCP, it's gonna take much longer than that. There's a lot of additional effort required there. Or you could go for something like I've already mentioned, uh, enterprise ready solution like Traffic Parrot. So what is Traffic Parrot? Well, if you're looking for over the wire stubbing or if you want to call it service virtualization, if you're looking for service a service virtualization tool and you're doing continuous delivery, continuous integration and similar agile practices or you're aspiring to do those and you're aspiring uh, to make your QAs work closely with this, or maybe they're already working closely with this, and you need support for many protocols, and you would like to work your tool to work on site on an, or in a private cloud, not necessarily a public cloud, then I would encourage you to go to trafficparrot.com and see what else we have to offer for you and how we could help you achieve those goals. 
So yeah, that is it. That's my story with service virtualization, going through four companies, having different experiences, using different types of tools. And I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks very much for watching.